So once again, we do want to uh, take a quick moment to say thank you again to our sponsors, Augusta University, for this awesome facility, uh, and to our in-kind sponsors who provided those great gifts. We hope you all enjoyed them. We hope you've enjoyed today. Uh, we are very thankful to Mr. Bill Banamura. <laughs> Actually, that's Phil Planamira. Uh, so I hired Phil back in June as Chief Operating Officer of Security Onion Solutions. And one of the first things I told him was that I want you to take Security Onion Conference and just go and do it. And boy, did he do it, right? Yeah. So if you had fun today, did you enjoy it? Yeah. Give Phil a round of applause. <laughs> You're fired again. Uh, so we did say thank you to Evan and to the AV crew. Thank you so much for recording us. Thank you to our volunteers today. Uh, there have been so many folks that have gone into making today happen and making a today a success. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, another special person I do want to mention, uh, Mr. Wes Lambert. Stand up. So if you're on our mailing list, you've probably seen Mr. Wes Lambert. Uh, he's there answering questions almost every single day. Yep. Lately, he's been submitting pull requests via GitHub. He's been coding up like a mad man. So we really appreciate all the effort that uh, Wes has put in lately. So I wanted to recognize him. All right, so we've had some amazing talks today. Have you enjoyed the talks? Yeah. Have you learned something new? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Woo! excellent, excellent. So we've had some amazing technical talks. You've learned something new. And now for something completely different. Okay, so for this talk, the state of the onion, in order to talk about Security Onion, I'm not going to talk about Security Onion at all. What? Wait, what? <laughs> Did, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to talk about Security Onion at all. Wait, what? Yeah, so don't freak out. Don't say, okay, well, the gifts are gone. Like, there's no more swag. I'm just going to leave. If Doug's not going to talk about Security Onion, I'm just going to get out of my car and go, right? So don't leave, it's okay. I'm, this is going to make sense. Wait, there's too much time, let me sum up. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you a story and I'm gonna try to make this relevant to Security Onion, okay? So, with apologies to the Goldbergs, it was 1980 something, okay? I was just a wee lad and we had this video game, my very first video game console, the Magnavox Odyssey 2. Has anybody ever had one of those? A couple of people. I'm actually, I'm very surprised. Well done, sir. Uh, so, very, very rare, right? Most folks are familiar with the Atari 2600, the 5200 maybe, right? But if you're old school, if you're hardcore, you go with the Magnavox Odyssey 2, as we did, okay? So we had this Magnavox Odyssey 2. Now something very important to mention, and it may be hard to see in the picture, but that joystick, Tim, do you remember the joystick? Like it was so skinny and it was so fragile. That's a very important point, which I'll come back to in a minute. So I was playing Magnavox Odyssey video games and I was, I was trying to you know, beat those games. I was trying to make my adversary cry. I was trying to beat the computer. But I was young, I was like six years old, I was uncoordinated, I couldn't do it. So the computer actually made me cry, okay? <laughs> so I was really getting into it, I was really trying to beat this computer, and I was playing so hard, I actually broke the joystick. Tim, did you break your joystick? I didn't. No. Okay, so I did. <laughs> so, yeah, I know where you're going with that. So. <laughs> So, PG-13. <laughs> so yeah, 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 yeah. Let's let's keep it above board. All right. So, so we had this Magnavox Odyssey, and I really wanted to play it, but you know the joystick didn't work. So, my dad, who was here earlier today, he had to leave early. Or, uh, early so, uh, what he did was he said, "Okay, no problem. I got this. Right? I got this multimeter. We got this other joystick over here." He went to Radio Shack and he bought a joystick, and he cut the wires. And he used the multimeter to figure out which wire went to which button, went to which up, down, left, right. Okay, cool. So then he took the multimeter, he toned out all the circuits, he figured out what went where, and he wired up this new joystick, wrapped it with electrical tape, we turned it on, and 
It worked. It was amazing, right? I was like, Dad, you're a genius. You built this Frankenstein joystick computer thing and it actually works. It's amazing. And that was my first introduction to hacking of any kind, right? The traditional real hacking. Uh, so, you know, taking something that wasn't intended to do something and using it for something else. That's a pretty powerful concept. And I learned that at a very young age. I was like, what kind of sorcery is this that you can just like take this and put it over here and you can wire it together and make it work? That's just magic. Like, are you an alien from another planet with superior intelligence to do this kind of stuff? That's crazy. All right, so fast forward a couple of years. Uh, so Magnavox Odyssey kind of went out of style, you know. Uh, it didn't have that long of a lifetime. So what was the next major video game console? Mm. Nintendo, yeah, everybody had the Nintendo, right? So if you had a Nintendo, raise your hand. Okay, very good, so that's most of you. So did your Nintendo look like this? <laughs> no, so that's actually me in 1989, right? So you can see the Nintendo up there, you can see the controllers, right? How cool is that? So, so as a hardcore Nintendo fan, and loyal subscriber of Nintendo Power Magazine. <laughs> Remember that one? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was flipping through Nintendo Power and there were these people who wrote in and said, hey, check this out. I built my own NES arcade. And I was like, dad, we gotta do that. So we did, we built that thing right there. And I was so proud of it. I was like, we don't even need to paint it. We just take it in the house, raw plywood and all. <laughs> Right? So that was my NES arcade. Now there's a couple of other interesting things to note in this photo. So uh, number one, notice that this thing right here says Master Art Studio. Uh, I am not an artist. And this was actually Christmas. I think my parents were trying to tell me that I wasn't an artist and I needed some skills. Uh, the other thing to notice was on my bed, that's not actually a bedspread, that's actually a sleeping bag because I was too lazy to make the bed. So I just <laughs> throw the sleeping bag on the bed. So this is the kind of stuff that you reflect on when you go back and look at these old pictures like this, right? Uh, so that's pretty cool and kind of embarrassing at the same time. Sand cert right there too? Sand cert, yes, yes. Uh, at the, uh, at the uh, wise old age of 12 years old, sand cert, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> So, okay, so the Nintendo was very, very cool. Uh, but what was even cooler was the Super Nintendo. I mean, you take anything and put Super in front of it, man, that's cool. <laughs> right? But we went from 8-bit to 16-bit, to, 8 -bit to 16 -bit, and that's like twice as many bits. So twice as much cool, right? So Super Nintendo, I had that, and I was like, man, better graphics, better audio, more buttons. <laughs> Man, this is awesome. So, now for something completely different. What is past this prologue? So, what does that mean? Well, all of that kind of sets the stage for the future. Everything that we've experienced in the past sets our lens for how we interpret the future. Okay. Now we take a little bit different turn. So let's see where are we going now. So again, this is, this is all gonna come together. Just trust me, okay? So, what's this a picture of? B-Sides Augusta. B-Sides Augusta. Who was at last year's B-Sides Augusta? Most folks. Who's going to be there tomorrow? Uh, just about everybody. Excellent, excellent. So, B-Sides is awesome. Uh, we've worked very hard, and we expect it's going to be very, very awesome. So, tomorrow at B-Sides, Security Onion Solutions is going to have a vendor table. Now, Bill and I were sitting around and we were kind of contemplating ideas. You know, what would be really, really cool to put at a vendor table to kind of attract folks, to bring them in, to come to the vendor table? Any ideas? Video games? What would you do if you had just an art? Okay, here we go. Are you ready? Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Onion Arcade. Not bad.
bad, right? A little bit nicer than that old plywood thing that I had in my bedroom in 1989, right? So, Onion Arcade. So let me tell you the story of Onion Arcade. Now, again, you may think that this is totally unrelated to Security Onion, but I'm gonna make this all wrap up in the end, okay? So just trust me. So let's talk about Onion Arcade. So I said, you know what? We need to build this Onion Arcade thing. So, hmm, we gotta go with the Super Nintendo because obviously Super Nintendo is better than regular Nintendo. Now, rabbit hole here. Now, of course, you could go and get a Raspberry Pi and you could do the emulator thing and you could do the ROM thing, but, you know, that's questionable legality and we have to stay away from that. Plus, you know, what's the fun? I mean, that's just way too easy. This is gonna be a lot more challenging. Let's go for the challenging thing, right? So, okay, we get a Super Nintendo. I got on eBay. I ordered, oh, so first, wait a minute, rabbit hole here. So, how many different versions of Super Nintendo are there? Four. Well, there's Japanese. Let's, let's just classify US, US-based versions of Super Nintendo. Two? I hear two. Any other guesses? Four. There are four, and I had no clue. Yeah, well, well done. Good job. <laughs> Mad props. There you go. So four different versions of Super Nintendo. This happens, anybody know what this is called? This is the Super Nintendo Junior. Okay, uh, so, and I needed this because this is the only one that was small enough to fit inside this cabinet. Okay, a full-size Super Nintendo just wouldn't fit. All right, so there's lots of rabbit holes here, uh, and there's a purpose to all these rabbit holes, I promise. So then you have another question. Well, and this picture is hard to see due to the lighting. This is a Super Nintendo here, and this is a real ViewSonic HDMI monitor here. So what kind of video outputs does a Super Nintendo have? Composite. Standard is composite. Depending on the version and depending on what kind of cable you have, you may have S video out. If you're a hardcore retro gamer, you can actually get a SCART RGB cable, and that's really cool. Uh, but so here, what I did was I got a Super Nintendo Mini with an S video. It had been modded for S video output because that's hardcore, right? Took that S video out and put it into a FrameMeister scaler to upscale it to real HDMI. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So if you're gonna do something, do it right, right? Okay. So we've got Super Nintendo hooked up to FrameMeister Scaler, hooked up to HDMI monitor. Now we have to make it pretty because nobody wants to cart around like all these pieces parts, right? Okay. So. Start down the route of this whole cabinet thing, and you can buy these cabinet kits, uh, but then you have to like do artwork. And you remember that picture I showed before where I told you that I'm not an artist, yep. right? Okay, so I am not an artist, but you know what? I was able to Google for Creative Commons licensed graphics, and I found this Mandelbrot fractal, right? And it's really cool looking, uh, and the whole fractal thing kind of fits in with onions and kind of zooming in and layers and peeling back the layers and stuff like that, so I thought it worked. So I pulled that up into the GIMP graphics editor, I added some neon logos, and bingo, I'm an artist! <laughs> I think it turned out okay. So here's some of the pieces, parts that I received in the mail. Uh, this was gonna be a tremendous undertaking. If I had to cut all of the MDF and I had to cut all of the acrylic and drill all the holes, that's just ridiculous. Ain't nobody got time for that, right? <laughs> so I paid this guy to produce this cabinet kit and to pre-install my artwork. Uh, and so he shipped all these pieces parts, but I still had to put them all together. Uh, so there's the acrylic. Uh, there's the joystick panel before the joysticks and buttons had been installed. There are the sides on my floor. There's some of the wiring that you get. Uh, and oh, by the way, uh, if you, if you think your data centers are a mess when it comes to wiring, you should see the inside of here. <laughs> so lots and lots of wiring uh, because, oh, by the way, you know, each of these buttons has a ground and a signal wire, and then they also light up. So there's two other wires for that. So you're talking four wires per button. You do the math. It's too hard for me. <laughs> So there's the assembled button panel. Uh, there's a view of the backside before the wiring began. There's the buttons all lit up. LEDs for the win. 
Okay, so now pause, time out. Let's think about this now. We've got a Super Nintendo. We've got S-Video output going into a FrameMeister scaler, going into an HDMI monitor. Okay, so video signal's good to go. But now, how am I going to interface these things with the Super Nintendo? <coughs> Enter the multimeter. Enter the multimeter. Well played, sir. Okay, so here's what it looks like. You take a Super Nintendo controller. You take the case off. You pull out the PCB. You take an X-Acto knife and you start scratching away at that green stuff. And then you take a soldering iron and you burn yourself. And then, then you solder into the traces. Okay, and then you attach your wires, and this takes about 127,000 hours. Okay? <laughs> and that's just one controller. You got two of them. All right, so there's the first controller. All wired up. Yeah, that's kind of ugly, right? Yeah. It haunts me at night when I close my eyes. That's all I can see. <laughs> So there's the second one. I, I had a few lessons learned on the first controller, so this one came out a little bit cleaner, but still kind of ghetto. Uh, so, and my worst nightmare was that I was gonna do all this work and like assemble the cabinet and turn it on, and like the buttons wouldn't work because like something snapped off of the board. So like I hot glued like all over the place to keep all these wires stable. So lots and lots of hot glue. I think I used about 10 hot glue sticks. So there's your uh, wiring and the two PCBs. Uh, so it's coming together. You can actually see some of our course material in the background. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Uh, so another view of the wires. Okay, so at this point, you know, I said my worst nightmare was like, I assembled all this thing and it didn't work because the problem then is you can't just get in here and like troubleshoot stuff. You have to take this whole thing apart again, right? So test, test, test again, right? I tested every single one of these buttons like 100,000 times uh, to make sure it worked. All right, so that's cool. So then I started assembling. So you take one of the side panels, you throw on the controller panel. This up here is uh, the speakers. So you got an amplifier in there, two four inch Polk audio speakers. Yeah, if you're gonna do it, do it right. There's another view of the side coming together. A little bit more. Now, things start to take shape. All right, so that's actually running Super Mario. Pretty cool. Uh, starting to install the light strip, uh, and there you can see the lighted up marquee. Pretty cool, All right? So uh, it actually worked. I, I was amazed, right? I almost passed out when it actually did work. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it does work. So. Pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I have about 1,200,000 hours in the project at this point. <laughs> all right, so now the payoff. What does this have to do with Security Onion at all? All right, so a lot of lessons learned here that I think are actually very applicable to our community, to what we do as individuals, uh, and how we interact with each other. So number one, imposter syndrome. Anybody heard of this term? All right, so what is imposter syndrome? You're afraid we found out as an imposter. Exactly. Right, so feelings of being overwhelmed, feelings of being incompetent. When I started this project, I said, you know what? There's just no way I can do all of that soldering work and make this thing actually happen. Uh, and you know, when you start to look at this from like a project management standpoint, like I had to break it up into all these sub-projects. It was like, there is no way I'm gonna be able to pull this off in time for the big show, right? But I think what I found out was that, you know, if you just slow down, right, don't panic, keep calm and carry on, just go through things slowly and methodically, it will work out, right? So I think that's a great lesson to us to refuse to give up, right? Uh, as we are trying to go into battle every single day with our adversaries, don't give up, try to get a little bit better every single day, all right? Next lesson learned, using off-the-shelf parts, we can build amazing things, right? This is just MDF, some acrylic, some simple electronics, and it turned out kind of cool, right? So likewise, in our security community, we can take open source software, things like Snort, Suricata, Bro, NetSnivNG, Elsa, uh, 
you know, all of these great tools, we can put them together and we can build something that's amazing, uh, that can actually have a real quantifiable effect. Uh, and to use one of those dirty management buzzwords, a synergistic effect, right? We can take all these things, put them together, one plus one equals three, yeah, you know the drill. All right, so time is expensive, all right? So I mentioned before I have 1.2 million hours into the project at this point. Uh, so the cost of this project is roughly $27 trillion, okay? <laughs> World's most expensive arcade ever. So time is expensive. I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah, okay. That's what I thought. So, you know, I have so much time invested in this. Uh, it would have been nice if I could just like go to Amazon and say, I would like to purchase one Onion Arcade. Right? And have everything done for me, and just drop shipped. Uh, so that to me is kind of what Security Onion is, right? Because I still see a lot of folks every single day that are manually compiling Snort and manually compiling Suricata and going through all these gyrations. And once they finally get it working, then when there's a new version that came out, right now they have to start that process all over again, right? So I look at that and what I see is folks that are spending their time being sysadmins rather than being incident responders, right? And I think that's a poor use of our time, right? So I think this is where Security Onion can come in. And so if you, if you, if you have those friends that are still manually compiling stuff, right, be a friend and have an intervention with them and say, <laughs> you know, you should, you should really spend your time more wisely. Yes, there are use cases for that kind of stuff, but uh, I think there's a lesson learned there. Be agile. Uh, there were several points in this project where, you know, I would try something and then it just wouldn't work out, so I'd have to kind of back up uh, and then go down another road, right? I mentioned all the different rabbit holes of investigation that I had to do, right? So sometimes when we are hot on the trail of some adversary, right, we may, we may take a rabbit trail. Uh, we may kind of go off road, uh, but we need to, to have that agility because let's face it, our adversaries, they're agile, right? Uh, they may start with one tactic. If they're not getting into your network, they may switch tactics midstream. So we need to be agile as well. We want to make sure that we are not sort of locked into one vendor's way of doing things. Uh, this kind of goes hand in hand with uh, side quests, right? In video games, you have kind of the main goal that you're trying to get to, but sometimes you have to take this sort of side quest, this little journey over here, right? So sometimes we have to do that. Uh, I mentioned before rabbit holes. So if you're doing an investigation, you find yourself going down a rabbit hole, make sure you keep track of how deep that rabbit hole is. Right? So make sure you can find your way out of that rabbit hole. It's pretty important. Uh, I think another thing slightly related is uh, uh, hunting. You know, great term that uh, we're certainly talking a lot about these days. Uh, I had to go on eBay and I had to hunt for a Super Nintendo Junior with the S-Video mod already built into it, right? Uh, and because of that, we were able to succeed in our goal of building this thing that actually worked, right? So. That's just yet another illustration of if we are actually doing our hunting, uh, as opposed to some organizations are still just kind of relying on those IDS alerts. And guess what? IDS alerts alone are not enough, right? We need to be going out and doing proactive hunting and assuming that that compromise is already there, right? So don't forget about the hunting. Power up, right? So in games, like in Mario, you get a, you get a mushroom, you. You know, you turn into big Super Mario, you get a flower, you can now throw fireballs, right? So uh, the other thing to think about power up is in terms of hardware, we talked about how the original Nintendo was 8-bit, Super Nintendo was 16-bit, twice as many bits, right? So same thing with Security Onion, you know, in the history of Security Onion, we started out in 2008, we were 32-bit just because that was the easiest thing for me to build in my limited spare time. In 2012, we rebuilt the entire distro, went to 64-bit, twice as many bits, right? Twice as good. We also in implemented PFRing for better scalability. We implemented ELSA for a distributed database. So more and more power enables us to catch more and more adversaries uh, more and more quickly. Uh, we've done lots of good stuff uh, over the years. Uh, over the last year, you know, we moved from Ubuntu 1204 to 1404. Uh, we also implemented this new thing called best practices and setup, which makes uh, it more streamlined. 
Uh, it gives you kind of the, the standard best practices that we kind of recommend out of the box to make things easier for you. Uh, so just trying to make you more effective, more efficient as incident responders. Don't be a run, one trick pony, right? So when you're playing video games, especially fighting games, you know, you learn that one move. You start doing that one move all over again, right? Every single time you're using that one move. But then you finally get to that one boss and he just doesn't care, right? And he's just tearing you up because all you know is that one move, right? Same thing happens in real life. Uh, I mentioned before the whole IDS alerts thing. I still see way too many folks way too focused on just IDS alerts. If that's your one trick pony, you're being beat up all day long, right? So make sure that you're not just relying on that stuff. Make sure that you're doing the, the hunting as well. It's all about the fundamentals. Uh, I think this is a really good point. You know, modern video games, they are amazing in terms of video quality, audio quality. They've got great 3D graphics. I mean, it's like, it's like real life, right? Uh, but, you know, me personally, sometimes I just want to play a good old game of Super Mario Brothers. Am I the only one? Anybody else like that? So, I think the, the lesson to be learned there is that those older games, because they didn't have the amazing graphics of today, they really, really had to focus on gameplay. Like, what makes a really fun, interesting game, right? And I think that's a good lesson for us. Uh, because you know we need to make sure that we're not forgetting about the fundamentals, right? Way too many organizations are you know just way too focused on getting that shiny silver bullet. You know they saw that marketing slick and it was talking about here's the latest and greatest thing, uh, and it's going to be the magical box that you need to buy that's going to solve all your problems. Uh, while they've forgotten about the fundamentals, right? Organizations still aren't watching their DNS traffic. We talked about that a couple of different times today. Organizations still aren't really looking at all of their HTTP logs in depth and slicing and dicing those things. So don't forget about the fundamentals. That feeling. So do you remember when you were playing a video game and you've been playing this thing for days, maybe weeks, and you were like really, really close to the end. And there was that final boss and you just couldn't beat him. But then there was that one day where the stars align and you beat that guy. You remember that feeling? Is that like the greatest feeling ever? It was like a total like high, right? Well, you know, that's the kind of high that we can get, right? If we are successful in remembering all of these lessons learned, right? And we're able to catch the bad guys that are in our networks and able to kick them out, right? Uh, for those of you who have done that, you know what I'm talking about. You know that feeling of watching that bad guy intercepting what he's doing, kicking him out of the network, and just kind of laughing at him, right? Uh, and that's a really great feeling. Uh, community. Uh, this is a really good, important point. You know, as I was working on this project, uh, I had to do lots and lots of research. Uh, I had to do, go into all of these retro gaming communities, and, and these folks had documented all of this stuff about all the different versions of Super Nintendos, all the different wiring schemes, uh, all the different ways that you can connect this thing to that thing to this thing and make it work. And I was able to benefit from all of that information, that documentation, those videos, and that was amazing. And that's what we need to be doing as well, right? Uh, that's what today, this event, is all about. It's all about building community, bringing in folks, not just from this area, but from other areas as well, getting you outside of your comfort zones, right? getting you to meet some folks that you've never met before, uh, and starting a discussion, starting a dialogue about what are our best practices? What are the things that we have learned? What are the things that are working for us uh, and may work for you as well, right? So building community uh, is very, very powerful. Uh, and last but not least, grateful. Uh, again, you know, I was able to document, uh, I was able to uh, learn from all the documentation that was out there and build this thing. And I was very, very grateful for all that documentation. Uh, and likewise, I'm very grateful for uh, all of the individual open source projects that we have been able to leverage inside of Security Onion, all of those individual communities, uh, so many great folks that have kind of 
blazed the trail before us, right? Uh, so, you know, last year we had Todd Heverline who wrote the original paper on NSM 25 years ago, uh, which was inspired by uh, Cliff Stoll, who wrote The Cuckoo's Egg uh, back in the 80s. Uh, and these guys are just pioneers, right? Because they spent the time to document what they did, you know, I'm very grateful uh, for their inspiration. Uh, likewise, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for all of the open source tool authors that we worked very closely with over the years. Uh, thankful for that. Uh, and, and finally, I'm, I'm grateful for each and every one of you here today. Uh, I really appreciate you being here, being a part of this event, and being a part of this community. So I want to encourage you to uh, continue to grow the community. Uh, and you know, it doesn't have to be just a one day event, one time a year, right? We can continue to build our community. We can continue to go out and do good things uh, and peel back the layers of your network and make your adversaries cry. So thank you all very much. Uh, I really appreciate you being here. Uh, any other administrivia? Oh, you know what? I was about to forget. There are some other things. So if you're going to be a B-Sides Augusta, make sure you stop by our vendor table. This will be hooked up and playable. So we will have a few different games throughout the day. We're not going to tell you what games. We're not going to tell you when they're going to be available. You have to stop by the table and see. Uh, we do hope you enjoy playing it as much as I enjoyed building it. <laughs> so one more thing. Uh, if you are watching your RSS feeds, as I know at least one person was, <coughs> Dayton, um, <laughs> uh, what you saw at about 3 p.m. Eastern time was a uh, blogger published my blog post announcing the latest version of Security on 1404.5.1. It's got all the latest and greatest updates from Ubuntu and from Security Onion. Uh, it's got the very latest Ubuntu 1604 hardware enablement stack, so the latest and greatest kernel, the latest and greatest driver support. Uh, everything is, is uh, top-notch, right? premium, just like this thing right here. If you're going to do it, do it right. This is the best ISO image we've ever produced. Uh, I'm very, very proud of it, and hope you're able to use it to great success. Did I miss anything? All right. Well, again, thank you all very much. Uh, we appreciate you being here today. We hope you had fun. We hope you learned something. We hope to see you back tomorrow, not in this building, but in the other campus downtown. And we hope to see you back next year. So thank you all very much. <laughs>